If it happens that you've grown numbed and desensitized by soulless and endless iterations of once-beloved properties and lecturing identity politics, have come to regard Hollywood as like some rusted, poorly tuned engine that won't turn properly, revs feebly and keeps cutting out, and that entertainment has become a surreal postmodern psycho nightmare to the extent you almost wish you had a hybrid power of Thanos and David Zaslov to snap half of Tinseltown out of existence. Then, you'd best sit down and brace yourself, because I'm about to describe The Acolyte, a show that clearly doesn't just suck balls, or even post-gym sweaty balls, but in fact sucks unshowered, long-haul trucker in an unconditioned vehicle trundling through a humid Florida summer balls. Headland Show, debuting on Disney+, Plus, is set in the final days of the High Republic era, touts itself as female-centric, will showcase people of colour, and will be influenced by Headland's queer perspective. There's just no way that me being a queer woman is not going to be reflected in my work, Hedlund explained. I could try not to do it, but why would I? What, what is this with everybody? No, 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 no. What is it? It's really? Only me. It's why? My I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm serious. Jodie Turner Smith, famous for playing a colorblind casted English Tudor Queen Anne Boleyn, and for complaining that Star Wars is very patriarchal, plays the lesbian leader of a regal coven of witches. So what's going on here? <laughs> so what's going on here? What's going on here? Hedlund cast her wife in the role of a Jedi Master, giving her a lightsaber that can transform into a whip. You brought no it on way! You brought it on yourself. I don't want you here! Hedlund added Jocelyn Bio, a Ghanaian-American writer, to the team for the Acolyte, specifically because Bio was not a Star Wars devotee. She asked me what I knew about Star Wars, and my answer was, Harrison Ford runs around space with a giant dog? Bio recalled, laughing. And Leslie said, you're hired. Fucking A, man. It drives me nuts. Needless to say, we're all entitled to interpret this as horseshit. And not ordinary horseshit, but rather the excremental outpush of a poor filly that, removed from its diet of oats and compelled to eat old straw, and indulged in too many sugar cubes by its owner, and drinking fetid ditch water, gets an upset tummy, raises its tail in anticipatory discomfort, and discharges a spray of hot diuretic horseshit. In a lightweight New York Times piece, the writer lamented that a loud, primordial part of the Star Wars fandom has pushed back in predictable fashion. Kathleen Kennedy weighed in by saying, It's a version of the same misogyny and racism that greeted Rey in The Force Awakens. Kennedy, who runs Lucasfilm, has also experienced it, with South Park harshly attacking her in an episode last year. The inference here is both snide and inept. What is the it Kennedy is allegedly experiencing? Misogyny. Where has she allegedly experienced it? South Park, the long-established, savvy, satirical show that has tackled innumerable issues and follies in often cleverly deconstructed ways. Representation is all fine and good, if you're wanting to be proportionately representative. But there's a difference between including diversity and showcasing diversity, which is the term Hedlund and Kennedy are going with. If you're being representative in a way the bulk of people would acknowledge is decent and proper, then, if you receive criticism, you can take the moral high ground and rightly push back. But if you've opted to showcase diversity, then you've made an aesthetic, stylistic, and identity politics choice, which is then subjective, and open to being dissed by streaming subscription-paying customers who feel the entertainment product is suffused with identity preoccupations and interests, which not only meddles with the illusion of fantasy on screen, because you've got people totting up ethnicities during scenes, with a drab sense of half-conscious or deliberate socio-cultural decision-making going in to the assortment of actors and background talent, you're also making the whole enterprise Prize feel a little stilted, with a kind of identity politics inflation, where the more identity preoccupations you shovel into a show, minority, lesbian, empowered women, often overlapping, the more it becomes clumsily evident, the more contrived it seems, and the less value it has, because the show will have a welling and teeming vibe of it of being about you, and a Los Angeles social milieu very, very close, rather than a galaxy far, far away. The show features Jodie Turner-Smith, the figure from Star Wars Celebration, who claimed that Star Wars is very patriarchal. I feel like Star Wars is, is very, like, patriarchal. And in a scatterbrained, lame kind of way, she is half right, though she neglected to take the idea to the logical next step of pointing out that the baddies in Star Wars have always been patriarchal and had upper-class tough English accents but inevitably got their comeuppance and were displaced by goodies who featured the likes of Princess Leia and Mon Mothma. She also seemed to have sort of forgotten or not bothered to recall that the sequel trilogy featured a phenomenally virtuous, powerful, independent, strong female character who becomes a kind of space Jesus and bonds with the symbolic righteous figurehead of Princess Leia. She's a powerful leader. 
and the plucky Rose, who intervenes to literally shunt a man out of the way from making a noble sacrifice. Yes, yes! And that trilogy having an intermission of a film Rogue One, featuring a strong female character protagonist, and The Mandalorian effectively becoming the Bo-Katan show, and Kenobi effectively playing daddy daycare to a plucky young Leia. I feel like Star Wars is, is very, like, patriarchal. And Andor featuring Mon Mothma again, as well as a pair of lesbian insurgents. She's a powerful leader. And Ahsoka, the wise and powerful Jedi, and her friend, the authoritative General Sandula, working in tandem with the edgy and ultimately powerful Sabine Wren. But apart from that, what is absolutely essential is that we have a show with a whole bunch of strong female characters, helmed by a woman who conceived the series to be Kill Bill meets Frozen, and is a celebration of sisterhood. If you wish to see a classic property through the lens of queerness, or gender, or race, and your show crashes or is met with indifference because identity and representation has been disproportionately forefronted over originality or merit in the fiercely contested marketplace of entertainment, then that is not the audience's fault. It's just nickels and dimes, horses for courses, cause and effect. Much of what you're doing isn't inherently liberal at all. And utilizing existing properties and being derivative, and co-opting and strip mining what's come before, you're being creatively reactionary, no matter how much of a progressive patterner you put on the content you produce. What the New York Times, Headland, and Kennedy might not be able to get their heads around is the idea that the criticism of their show might not be reactionary, morbid, insecure negativity, but just plain old indifference. They might like the idea of taking what is essentially a boy brand and, for financial and cultural motivations, shaping it more toward being an equal representation, equal opportunity brand. But you can't socially engineer entertainment, or fan bases, especially not ones that have evolved and endured over decades. It doesn't reflect poorly on anyone if they're just not into a show touted as being woman-centered, or if they're just not into a show replete with Sith Scissor Sisters, or if they're just not that into male characters, and the actors who play them, being lightweight, benign, not especially masculine in any relatable or compelling way, and who even managed to screw up the absolute basics of the show, like this poor soul. But if you can't look and see that Anakin blowing up the Death Star possibly killed millions and millions of people. We're just not that into conscious identity politics and entertainment. We're just not that into preemptive pushback against critics and the tired old focus on a small minority as a way to explain away a larger majority of perfectly reasonable people who see this kind of stuff and can discern the sanctimonious self-insert motivations a mile off and get exasperated by it and don't tune in no matter how many key jangling lightsabers you cram into a trailer. Star Wars is so atrophied, so utterly ridden with hacks, activists, and second-rate creatives that it is hard to feel anything like contempt anymore. Nothing is on a grand scale, there are no grand ideas. It's just fan fiction with no merit or charm or style. We're just not into it. Hmm.